So, so one thing I noticed in all the interviews that are recorded online is that actually, Steve, there's nothing that you ever talks about how you actually initially learned to play the guitar. Uh, and and who who were your greatest influences in terms of your guitar Under playing toilet. style <laughs> and, and, and and its development over the years? Well, um, my mother was musical and she got me learning the piano from the age of four. Right. And then for some reason I just got this obsession with the guitar. When I was nine, I barrageded them to buy me a guitar. And the first things I was listening to were things like Lonnie Donegan. And the shadows, that was my first ever influences of it. So I'm Buddy Holly. This is right, this is sort of late 50s, early 60s. And I've, I've potted around on the guitar. And actually, by the time I got to the age of about 12, I realised I was getting quite good. And then I met fellow musicians at my senior school. By now, I was at senior school. And we formed a group. And then we sort of, it just all just mushroomed from there, really. Obviously, I, I moved into electric guitar once I got confident that that was where I wanted to go. Right. I didn't want to be a folk guitarist. <laughs> yeah, and and then your first recorded release was I think it's pronounced Azuchiel. Oh, Azuchiel. in nineteen sixty nine. So, like, what what was its theme? What does the title mean? And how was this first studio exper experience jamming with? your former members of, uh, of Uriel? Well, it was um, basically the other guys, and this is the group we formed at school, and actually got quite good and got a bit of a reputation. And they, the other guys wanted to do it for real, and they actually wanted to leave the school and just do it. But for various reasons, family reasons, I was unable to do that. I, my parents were dead set on me going to university time. But... Um, so the guys left the school, they forged ahead, but they got they got contacted by someone who just wanted to do a music for hire album. And that's what Arzakel was. So they got me in and we just sort of threw together some songs, went in the studio for a day. I thought it was a great way of getting a bit of studio experience. And that was that's how it came about. It wasn't uh, any sort of deeply thought about meaningful uh, long-term statement it was just uh, four guys going in the studio for a day and just sort of throwing around some ideas but it came out pretty good I mean I, I, I still like it great <laughs> and uh, Michaela, <coughs> I believe at this time you were getting involved in film yeah uh, writing and acting so can you tell us a little bit about this part of your life uh, well, I start. Uh, I was a movie editor. Start learning editing, and then I got bored with editing, so I start uh, wanted to go on shooting. So I became a script girl, and then I became an actress. And then I uh, edited the film on Gong, so Gong oh. came to my editing room, and then I went and decided to live with them. <laughs> right, okay. So that, that was the first time you ever saw Stephen? No, I met Stephen... Uh, when I went to tour with Kevin Ayers. Oh yeah, he was with Kevin Ayers. And uh, he was... Uh, I wasn't in Gong when she... She was already part of the Gong family when I arrived. And I went yeah. to see him, to see them. And then at the end of the, of the show, there were pianos there. It was on the, on the Maison de la Radio, in the, in the radio house. Yeah, yeah, the RTF. RTF, the French stuff. And I started playing keyboard with my bottom. <laughs> and that's Steve. I thought, Love wow, that. she's got talent. <laughs> <laughs> she's got talent. I feel like a Hollywood producer, my big score. She's got talent. <laughs> and uh, that was the beginning of a uh, relationship, in a way. Cool. So, and, and then, so Steve, you joined up officially with Gong just after that in 1973 and you were part of the sessions for the Flying Teapot. So what, what did you learn musically at this time, both from David Allen and from your fellow Gong members? Well, I mean, I was in Gong for three years in the 70s and it was an exhilarating roller coaster, of, uh, a lot of chemical intake and uh, psychedelic experiences and um, amazing music so it was a sort of like 
really pivotal moment in my whole life, actually. So and I learned you, many you, things. You learned glissando guitar. Okay. Well, I already was doing glissando, but David taught me how to do it properly. Yeah, yeah. But mm. just the whole thing. David was a big influence on the whole idea idea of um, blending musical artistic output with a philosophical spiritual approach and so he was very influential on on me and uh yeah it was an amazing period and what, what, what are your memories of this time in the commune in france and then later in the uk maquette and and also what what was your musical input at this time because i there believe, was not, I believe that you had, you had, you had, you had too, many me too much memory no. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, for me, it was a, a fantastic thing because they were in Gong. There were this guy called Tim Black. Yes. Yeah. And Tim Black uh, was a, a wizard in the, with an the EMS synthesizer, and that was the first synthesizer. They were just coming up. Right. And and I, I just fell in love with this, and I didn't know any musical stuff. I was uh, with Gong. I was dancing. I was doing theater with David. Well, you were singing as well. I yeah, was yeah. singing a bit. And but percussion you know, and... Yeah, all those yeah. kind of things. I was doing stage kind of, uh, but not really music. And uh, and uh, when when I saw this, uh, I start really getting in, lo in love with those EMS. And Steve Dad, really nicely, bought my first EMS. Really? Wow. And that's, I still have it. I still play with it. So wow. that was the uh, beginning. So, and it was uh, at the time it was a uh, it was not too many synthesizer player, isn't it? Certainly not lady synthesizer player. Apart no. from Wendy Carlos, who originally was Walter, but she yeah. became Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I'm, I'm afraid to go back just to Steve because um, I've asked him this question before and I found his answer very interesting. Um, so, Steve, what what would you say Gong contributed musically to keeping alive the psychedelic spirit of the sixties? Um, <clears throat> well, obviously, David was was involved right from the beginning in the 60s. He was originally in the sort of beatnik movement in the early 60s when he first came over from Australia. But and in a soft, way... Was he because, soft machine as well? Huh? Yeah. Is it, is yeah. David is soft machine as well, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. 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 He's soft yeah. machine, yeah. Yeah, he was in the soft machine. He would have liked the sort of... The other role, main psychedelic role, band think, yeah. with the Pink Floyd in sort of UFO club in uh, yeah. 67. And he actually, he, he had to leave the soft machine because they came back from a tour of France and his visa as an Australian had, had a problem and they wouldn't let him back in England. So he decided to stay in France and that's when he sort of formed Gong initially as a kind of artistic psychedelic collective. And it, gradually became a band right and in a way it was like we saw gong as a, like a second wave of psychedelia because the sort of the end of the 60s it all got a bit difficult with things like altamont and charles manson and everything sort of got a bit stale and we felt we were sort of like you know relighting the torch and starting a second wave of it that's the way we saw it Along with them, um, you know, felt a lot of affinity with German bands like Can and Neu, all that sort of second wave seventies psychedelia. That's the way we saw ourselves. Yeah, yeah, and and then from that, um, uh, I presume you'd come to musical attention to different people around in the musical world because I only realised recently when I looked into the background that you were chosen to play guitar on one of the few promotional performances of Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells which I think was one of the first electronic albums ever released, certainly by Virgin Records. Well, it was the first, well, the first album. But we'll made by Virgin. Virgin, yeah, well, basically, <laughs> yeah, we... we made album. Virgin. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I had a connection and, 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 with Mike and, and, anyway, because I kind of vir right. virtually... Re I was his virtual replacement with Kevin Ayer's band, because before yeah. that he played... He was a guitarist in Kevin Ayer's in the whole world. And then I was a guitarist in Kevin Ayer's second band, which is when I met Miquette. And before right. that, and he'd left a Kevin Ayer's band to do his solo album, which eventually became Tubular Bells. Yeah. And when we, when we all rocked up to the Manor to do the Flying Teapot album, he was there as well, and he was going in in the night when we were not working. He was using the downtime to finish his record, and so we, and 
Flying Teapot and Tubular Bells were launched at the first, same time by Richard Branson on his new Virgin Records label. And Richard had this idea of doing this big promotional gig and he got various people in, including me to play guitar. Also the drummer of Gone, Pierre Merlin. And, and, and we did and this was, concert at recorded, the Queen Elizabeth yeah. Hall in, in June of 73. That's, that's, that's how it all started. And, and it was recorded by the BBC? And that, was, that was not the... Re the BBC recording was a later thing. Oh, OK. They redid re it, it for the BBC. Oh, okay. Some, <laughs> some um, bright spark of the BBC had the idea of redoing it okay. later in the same year. Right. So that's what I've seen. The real yeah. big one was the... One in June um, '73 at the yeah. Queen's Hall. And incidentally, it must be quite a big experience then. I presume it was quite nerve wracking. Yeah, uh, all, I was quite a laugh time. actually. I mean, no one <laughs> knew that. No one I had any idea that it was going to be that big. The record. It was like Richard Branson really pushed the boat out, really believing it. But in fact, the reaction at the end of the concert was so amazing. We suddenly we came away from that thinking, "Wow, this is this is a, this is going to be a phenomenon," and and it, and it was. But we had no idea what what how how big it would be. It was right. just an interesting thing to do, you know. Nice music. I enjoyed it. And as I was saying, incidentally, I've been signed up to do a rendition of orchestral tubular bells at the very same Queen Elizabeth Hall in June this year by the BBC. So. Fantastic. It, <laughs> Everything's become... It's the dog that keeps biting me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, obviously you don't always like dogs. You quite often like fish as well. Um, uh, eventually you ended up uh, recording solo and doing your own solo albums, which I think the first was Fish Rising yeah. in 1975. So how do you, did you decide to write each track on a solo album, even if it was with other musicians you'd worked with before? Because it must have been a big transition for you? Well, I'd already had my own project before I joined Gong. Okay. And uh, I'd actually stopped it when I was uh, just 21 because I felt I was too young to have all this sort of pressure. And that's why I ended up playing with Kevin Ayers and I kind of mutated into playing with Gong. But I still had the idea that at some point I was going to resume my solo career and uh, while I was um, in Gong, I put together Fish Rising, which a lot of it was material I already had before I joined Gong, but it obviously got heavily infected by being in Gong. And a lot of the musicians on the Fish Rising and were actually the other musicians from Gong. But then after we left Gong, we left, McKett and I left together, we decided to forge on our own and do work with different people. And it was... Uh, Another roller coaster ride. Yeah, we're well, co coming to Maquette. So Maquette, um, I, I, as far as I know, you did have a contribution musically to that album, and how had it changed by the time of Motivation Radio in 1977? And I believe you also wrote Side A of Rainbow Dome music, released in 1979. Um, so what what were you working with technically then to produce this different types of uh, these, these different albums, and and what was your musical influences on those albums? Well, I don't know. It's just like, uh, like sa same than now. We just kind of do it, do everything, kind of together, bounce from one each other. Right. But, but you said about getting this first EMS synthesizer. So oh, we should have by the time. You, you, but, but I don't. I don't really. I don't really play keyboard. I play noise. You see what I mean? Yeah. I play a bit of keyboard, but I, I, with the EMS, we used to do sequence. Like there is a sequencer that is flat. And we used to go like this and kind of s s uh, uh, slow it down and make sequences. And uh, I, I was like, uh, I never kind of like, you know, I play a little bit, but not very, very, I'm not a virtuoso. Okay. So. Yeah, and but you had quite a big rig when we were touring with the Steve yeah, Village but, Band. But, it wasn't uh, just the EMS. I, uh, yeah, but, but, but we had this, this engineer. And I presume you were also listening to, to what Steve was, was, <coughs> was, was, was playing as part, as part this of Fish Rising. This engineer, which is now one of the boss of uh, Function One, hmm. and that was our engineer originally. And I had an harp, and, uh, and in the in the two sides of the harp, there is two harp synthesizers, there is two speakers. And John, the the the, the our engineer made like jacks 
in all the speakers. So I would plug everything in those jacks and make like crazy sequences. And and with Steve as well, we had like it was a nightmare actually because we had to kind of tune all the EMS. We had to tune everything like uh, the to tune the the, the uh, uh, we had like knob in a knob in a knob to be really in time with a drummer. It was like uh, it was madness. Yeah, we had, <coughs> we had a lot of custom customized equipment. Right. Yeah, I can imagine actually. It was, thing, a, everything was coming. it was it was a real, really, uh, really like intense time actually. <coughs> we, we couldn't handle it after after nineteen eight. Oh dear. <laughs> can, he I, has water. can I have some water? Yeah, yeah go ahead. And, and, and Steve, you also worked with Nick Mason um, from Pink Floyd on Green. Yeah. Uh, what did you learn from him about their sound, which you could incorporate in your well, own We had music? a connection with him already because he produced the last Gong album we were involved with, Shamal. And um, working with him on Green was great. I mean, I, I learned a lot. I couldn't really list it out, but it was, uh, you know, obviously we were working at the Pink Floyd studio a lot of the time, Britannia Row, and right. chatting about how records were made. and but Just a few it things. Was just, you know, it was a few specific things you could tell I us. Mean, I mean, I was... I was the way they did I always said um, I was very lucky because uh, I worked with three great producers in the 70s, Todd Rundgren, Malcolm Cecil, who produced Motivation Radio, and Nick Mason, and I learned really a lot. And that really helped me when when I decided to stop the Steve Hillage band and work actually as a record producer. For Simple Minds, yeah? That was one of my early uh, incredible, big really. projects, yeah. So I got, I got a good grounding from working with these um, quite different but very interesting and inspiring guys. Yeah. And, and you've recently issued a box set of your uh, those early albums, posters, and a coffee table book um, called, I believe, Searching for the Spark, 1969 to 1991. So a, retrospe a retrospective of your early career going up to your first System 7 album. How did that come about? And I guess you're pretty happy with the result. Tracks like Beginning to See the Light, it must be amazing to see finally come out on a recorded CD. Uh, wow, it was a big, big, big project, I and mean, we do we put it all together in this 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 very room that you're sitting in now. And um, <clears throat> okay, the story is that for a long time EMI, who took over Virgin, were wanting to do remastered reissues of my solo albums. But I didn't want to do that without. A contract revision. Eventually, we finally got that together in 2006, and they were also talking about doing a box set. But I thought I wasn't quite ready to do a box set. We'll just do the remastered CDs for now. This is, but the idea was sort of planted, and then, um, quite a few years later, I was at the Prog Awards because they they gave me an award for a visionary, which is very nice. And um, there was um, an award being given for box set production, and it was one by this company called Snapper Records, for one they did for the family. And uh, I, I thought, oh, they look, they're interesting guys, they look like they know what they're doing. And lo and behold, about nine months later, they rang me up and said, we, We're thinking of um, what do you feel about doing a big box set of Steve Hillage, you know? And I said, OK. I suddenly thought, why? Well, OK, now the time's right. And so we um, thought about it a while. And we also collaborated a lot with our dear friend Johnny Green, of, who runs Planet Gong, which is sort of the Gong Appreciation Society. And he's a kind of archivist of what we've all done. OK. And uh, he was a very important part of this project as well. And we decided basically that the what would be interesting was to tell a story and basically the story of how I started off went through the whole 
rock music thing with Gong and Steve Village Band, but then, then then did record production. Eventually, found myself doing dance music. Yeah, and that's the the theme of the whole the whole box set. Is yeah, exactly. And then and how then, I ended up doing what we do now, basically. Yeah, exactly. And then jumping those years from from those last albums <laughs> to um, you first becoming both becoming influenced by the, the acid house scene. Um, what what was your first experience of it, Maquette? Oh, we've got to talk about the craft work. I've seen craft work. No, yeah. no, there was this really specific yeah, yeah, story. Yeah, I was just thinking that. There's, um, we both thought that. Yeah. Okay, it was actually, it was at a Steve Hillage band gig in Plymouth, a club called The Metro, 1978, okay. where before we played, they had a disco with a... And the DJ had just apparently got a copy of the Man Machine album and he was playing it like on this disco like really loud like We Are The Robots and Space Lab and all the people including quite a lot of young people were all dancing and I saw that I'd never imagined connected I'd always imagined like German music German psychedelic music and electro music something you sat cross-legged with a big conical joint and listened to and got stoned and seeing these people dancing to craftwork and hearing the sound with the kick drums and the synth sounds coming out like like well-formed eggs out of the sound system. It's in um, June 70, or May 78 or something. I thought, Eureka! And I rushed to the dressing room and I got Miquette. I said, Miquette, look, they're, they're dancing to craftwork. And she said, wow. And we just looked at each other and we thought, this is going to be fucking massive. <laughs> For fuck's sake, we had this vision of the future mm. and people dancing to electronic music. And yeah. So that pl that was a big moment. Yeah. And, and I mean, and, but we weren't, we didn't, it didn't we don't, this is 1978, we didn't yeah, exactly. immediately Ten run off and say, right, we're going to make electronic hey, dance music. Years. We were doing <laughs> our, our own stuff, but eventually, well, Having well, followed, well, we tracked well, the whole well, development. Well, we tracked the whole development. We followed it. We were, yeah. you know, we got when I was working with Simple Minds, I was quite involved with what they called futurism at that time in groups like Cabaret Voltaire. That was that was a kind of an early the precursor the to Acid House yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and uh, things like you know Planet Rock, Arthur Baker. We used to go to the Wag Club. Right. I mean, you know, we just tracked the whole thing. And then another big moment was. Um, so what, so what, what? What was your first sort of acid house party then? Because I believe oh, no, another I, big I, I believe moment. You met Alex Patterson. Uh, yeah, and I'll that, tell you another bit that. before that. There was another big moment. Yeah. Is that uh, when the first big raves started? Uh, we didn't go to very much because I, I was I was in America a lot at that, yeah, that we were time. Yeah, touring a lot. And uh, well, when I was producing in America a lot in '88. But um, our friend John Newsom, the very same engineer that did a lot of Miquette's synthesizer customising, right. and he's now one of the main guys of Function One. He used to have a company, the, before Function One they had a company, it was called Turbo Sound. And they got, they were, they got uh, him and his partner Tony Andrews, another very old friend of mine, who designed Got, Function One? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The yeah. Tony and John, they are Function One. Before yeah. that, they were Turbo Sound, and they used to, we used to use their sound systems. We were we were there like their prototype. We used their prototype rigs in the seventies. No and uh, so there's good, another yeah. big connection here. <laughs> and. Um, they start. They got involved with taking their personal rig to some of the orbit, uh, orbital, you know, around the M25 acid house parties. And they contacted me and said, Steve, man, there's something happening here. You've just got to get involved with it. It's the bomb, man. You got to... <laughs> so I was thinking, hello, 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 hello. Yeah. And, and so, you know, and then we started, started going to events. And uh, I always made a big joke about... And, and that's when you met Alex? I think you heard... Rainbow that was a, that was a, that was a slightly yeah. later story. Slightly yeah. later story. Yeah, but uh, I always make the joke that... Um, there was, there was a whole bunch of people who used to be in the psychedelic movement who who made a transition at that time. Not a lot, but quite. But we weren't alone, and we. I always used to joke that what interested me was the acid bit. <laughs> <laughs> so acid, acid. Hello, hello. Sounds good. 
but most people weren't on acid. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you and all your friends were like, why is everyone else, they're, they're all jumping around like with some big smiles on their faces. Like, no one's having an insular trip here. What's going on? <laughs> and we met Alex a little bit later. I was producing a band, um, but I was still working full out, full time as a producer at this time. I produced, in 89, I was producing a band for EG Records and Alex was working as an A&R man for EG Records. They were starting a fledgling dance label. And um, uh, the, the A&R person said, oh, there's someone here you really ought to meet. And it was Alex. So we met, we met him. I met him and I had a chat with him. We, we developed a great affinity. And then... Um, he said he really liked Rainbow Dome music. I said, oh, yeah, you really like Rainbow Dome? That's cool. And, uh, and he said, oh, we're, we're just starting these um, orb nights at uh, Land of Oz at uh, Heaven. Why don't you come down? So we went down, and it was it was amazing. When we walked we in the door, Club, yeah, Alex was playing Rainbow Dome music but mixing it with some beats. And at that point, we thought... <laughs> Fuck, this is what we've got to do. <laughs> um, so I've asked you this before, Steve, but your answer was very interesting. Um, so I can ask you again. What would you say Gong contributed musically to keeping alive the psychedelic spirit of the 60s? I'm very happy with that song. I love that song. Mm. I like it. With Anif uh, doing the rapping, Anif Cousins. Yeah. I met him I met him recently. He came, yeah. came to a gig we did uh, in Manchester a couple of years ago. Yeah, and, and, and that first album, is, I mean, it's it, looking at the track listing and at the, the uh, com contributors, it's an amazing mix of producers um, and, and different contributors. Um, the Orbs Forgotten member Thrash uh, and Youth Producing, uh, Maquette, yourself, uh, Anif Cousins and Alex Yeah, and he's, he's the guy who rapped on Freedom Fighters. Right, okay. R um, writing some tracks, Zoe as well, of course. Beloved co-founder Steve Waddington and even Paul Oakenfold's given the writing credit. Well, Paul Oakenfold was yeah. quite an influence on that record actually because he he was the guy who started Land of Oz, yeah. which took over from Spectrum at uh, Heaven, and he was the guy who had who had the idea of inviting Alex to do his own room. So it was actually at Paul Oakenfold's event that we had this experience of going in and hearing Alex playing Roma Dome music. And basically Alex introduced us to Paul and uh, we told him about, you know, what we were planning to do. We thought, well, you know, we want, we want, we want to sort of um, do a whole new project based around dance music. And he, he offered advice and help and he, and he collaborated on one of the tracks. So he was, you know, I've, and, and you yeah, said, I'm eternally said, grateful and, and for him. He, he, he kind of, he kind of, you know, him. helped, helped to get us uh, yeah. fully tuned in to the whole thing, right. you know. And, and you said Paul Oakenfold also. He, he had, he's got a contribution listed. What, what was his? Was he, was he also uh, working with you musically in the studio or something? Because obviously he was a DJ. He wasn't. Yeah, he was kind of like uh, uh, helping us to kind of. Uh, well, he was just like a he was just like a kind of advisor. Okay. You know, we were taking ideas to him and say, "What do you think of this?" And he was saying, "Oh, yeah, great! You ought to do a bit of that. You ought to do a bit of that." You know, he was. And where, where was it recorded or put together? Some of it in our house. Yeah, really. Not here. It was okay. before we got this place. Okay. And various uh, various studios, and mixed it. Do not erase. This is where we met Greg Hunter. Was it the same time we did Blue Room? No, Blue Room was uh, the year after. The year after yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I find. And we also, but basically, we did the did the first Orb album at the same time as the first System Seven album. They were, they oh, really? were like parallel projects. Oh, so you were working on the Orb album as well? Yeah. The, yeah, the, the, the Ultra Room. World, right? yeah. the, the Ultra World, yeah. the first album. Yeah. What synth do you tend to use? for System 7 stuff, in terms of a hardware synth or, 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 a, or Serum or anything like that on the software Serum. side? Serum. Animoog. Animoog. She loves the Animoog and the iPad. Oh, you've got Animoog, yeah. I right. love that. You know, Do you have any things like Jupiters and things like that from the old days, or, or they, that, that, those are all retired? What's, what's yeah. the they're, they're all, they're all, sort of, they're all oh, okay. going now. The old ones are going. We're not, we're not I, really I, like uh, kind of... I a, use um, native instruments quite mm. a lot, but there's... 
Also, there's a company called Output, in American company. I like I like a lot of their their yeah. stuff. Have you seen some of these new little mini Korgs they're releasing for two hundred and fifty dollars, like stripped down versions of the? Yeah, it's the kind big of ones. funny. You know, in Ozora, they had like I saw a few guys that have those little suitcase with all those little things, <laughs> <laughs> little button and things, kind of quite mm. a, quite amazing. I don't really care about how, how it's done. You know, a lot of people now saying, oh, you need to kind of go back to, uh, to analog and, and do things. So yeah, I think, Merv's doing great things with his, his Yeah, but I think, I think, yeah, d'accord. It's, take, it's taking but, a bit of time, though. <laughs> there is good musician and bad musician for me. Yeah. That's it. I don't care about what they use. Yeah. But you know, it's fun, you know, I love to have a go at uh, touching all the knobs of Merv. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, well, one thing we do, one of our specialities, we also, we, we manufacture synth-type synth synth sounds out of guitar sounds. Okay. That's one of the reasons why System Sim's got, we've got kind of a bit of a unique sound. We use a guitar in some ways that you wouldn't think it was and a guitar. Some, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, not all the time, and that's one some. of the things we do. Yeah, yeah, it's a good way. Of, it's a good way of working. Yeah, so, I mean, I mean, I presume obviously that that's all come into your new album because uh, uh, I didn't know until until just earlier today. But you literally just finished the new album. It's yep. gone off to be pressed. Cafe um, Seven. Cafe Seven. Yeah. So, uh, what 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 would you say it, it's changed or has had there been any major change since Up? Because uh, Up was sort of bringing back your more techno trance sort of uh, uh, influences and then mirror system is obviously a bit more minimal and stripped back and then you obviously did some in between the time of up and now you've done some very very different albums and some ambient albums as well um, so how, how does this new album compare we it's got a, got a bit of a spread yeah we decided to mix up everything we've, put, we've done a bit of everything really and we and I, I, I notice i look back on some of our earlier albums like the 777 album and the fire and water and it, it, that was a bit of a kind of bit of everything as well so i think we're in that sort of uh mode you know yeah. we've got some techno techno tracks and you've written a track with Marcus from trance, Sonkite. Trance, yeah. tracks, um, yeah, light love, trance, yeah. not heavy trance. Yeah. And we've got some chill out tracks. We've got a great, great uh, chill out track with Adja. Oh, it's chill out track. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, okay. So not, following on from, it's a from, chill out from no track. Novelty Engine. It's, which it's has based been a on an idea he he had when he came, he, he was backstage when we did, um, played Mirror System at Ozora in 2016. And he, he, he liked our set and he said it gave him an idea. And, and I said, oh, well, if you do something with it, maybe we could participate. And he did something with it. He sent it. What do you think of this idea? And we thought, fantastic, man. It's going on our next album. What do you think? He said, yeah, great. So, awesome. And we obviously developed it and tweaked it and added our bits. But that's, that's how it happened. And, and the, uh, the, the Sun Kite, is that, is that, um, is that a co-written co or remix or...? Uh, Mark, the Marcus trouble. You know, I'm, sadly, Songkai and their techno um, sister project, Mini Logan, no yeah. more as a oh, really? duo. Oh, I didn't know They're that. They're working separately now. Oh. And we, we've developed a real communication with Marcus, a lot, part, partly at Ozora. We've been hanging out with him a lot at Ozora because we've yeah, been there quite the last few years. And. Um, we um, we started doing sort of collaborative jam gigs with him. We used to we previously we did collaborative jam gigs with Songkai, and then we did some collaborative jam sort of short sets in between two two sets with him. One in Japan, and then we did one at the Eclipse Festival in America, and then we decided we wanted to do some studio stuff, sort of based on a bit of what we were jamming on stage that's how that one of the reasons that Psytrance became big in Japan it's a, it's a complicated connection it's because Goa was a Portuguese colony yeah so what was happening in Goa had a particular resonance in Portugal and also in Brazil was a, they were quite, quite early ad, adopters of sort yeah, of like Psytrance yeah, right, yeah. culture outside of outside of Goa yeah and there's a lot of um 
Brazilian people are actually of Japanese origin. Really? A lot of them. And there's a whole bunch, like when we go to wow. Universal Parallel, there's quite a lot of Brazilian Japanese yeah, like, there. They're they, very, they look great. They're quite tall, they're suntan, but Japanese looking. And they have connection, family connections with Japan. Yeah, yeah. And so Brazilian Japanese people in the early 90s were going over back to Japan and saying, oh, we've got this great new uh, music scene and it infected Right. In Japan, that was one of the, the starters. I've been told that by Japanese people. It was the Brazilian Japanese that... And then Japanese people started going to Goa. And you've also developed like an amazing relationship with Japan. I think you've played there 28 times or something. Well, 30 you? times. Really? <laughs> so, well, yeah, exactly. W w Wikipedia needs to be updated by you too. Cause it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's at least three years out of date now <laughs> <laughs> with regards to everything. But, yeah, um, yeah I think you first played there... Um, I think, was it, was it with Orbital again? Or was it 94. with Alex Patterson in 94? And then you've been back all these times since and you've written uh, this album, Phoenix Rising, with this Japanese rock band as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, how, how come the Japanese people, do, do, do they just love Gong? Do they... No. Well, no, well, that's do, do, do actually, they, it's the reverse of that. It's that I don't know. Japan is the... the a lot of people... Uh, Japan is the place where we're more, mostly known right. for System 7. Yeah. There's okay. obviously sort of some old long time fans who like Steve Hillage band and Gong. And I presume that but, 94 but basically System Seven is the thing that we're known then. for yeah. in Japan. That ninety four uh, that nineteen ninety four uh, experience when you first visited Japan must have made a big impression on us. Really, really <laughs> important yeah, Japanese. Yeah, that gig was a really big success, yeah, and it, it sort a, of it, it, it end up in the influenced street. quite a lot of people. Right. He end up at nine o'clock in the morning with Alex playing, uh, DJing mm, something, yeah. and uh, and what is those guys? Jason. Jason doing Cumbria, and they were mixing. <laughs> <laughs> this music and everybody was dancing in the street. It was amazing. Yeah, it was. It was a, after the club or after the after event. The, yeah, the club it was, kind of. It was, it was the closing night closing of that particular night of that club. club. Oh, right. so and it was a legendary event, and a, and a and a lot of people that were there at this gig, we we have seen, you know, you know. A lot of the people who who went on to be central in the sort of trance party scene mm. in Japan, well, like sort of visual guys and sort of sound system guys were at that gig and uh, I don't know we just locked into something it and was the, like it was like just you know just fell out of the and sky. And a lot of them yeah. were into rock and roll at the time and they came to that gig and that brings them to kind of a liking techno and psychedelic music afterwards psychedelic uh, and, and and that's when uh, this did, is that when this Japanese rock band heard you or they or they they just heard oh that you? came much that later came, came much later, later. <laughs> Rovo is it yeah. Rovo yeah. Yeah. yeah that came much later right okay because that's three years ago you did this album touring with, with Japanese is a delight yeah okay oh they're fantastic the drummer put all their wet socks on the on the in the <laughs> evening on the around their bench and they get drunk all right. But after the, in the morning, everything is super clean. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice. They're like fantastic. Well, it must have been quite a contrast to living with yeah, all these guys in yeah, the commune yeah, in, with, yeah. in, in the, back yeah. in the gong days. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so much back in the gong days. It's like no, it must be nice in comparison. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how do you keep it fresh writing after so many decades, not just years of music, and who inspires you musically now? I don't know. It just it just it just happens, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, you mentioned Adjo. As long as it, long as it, long as it, long as it. I mean, who who who, who inspires you musically now, like or, or within the last five years? You mentioned Adjo. Obviously, he's had an influence. Adjo inspires us actually. Yeah. Adjo is fantastic. He's amazing. Oh, he's he's a really good guitar player yeah. as well. Yeah. And we really enjoyed doing the novelty engine things yeah. with him at yeah. Azura. His Adjo is like such a kind of. It's fantastic because he he can build equipment he can play anything he record when you when you're in his studio we had the ball isn't it yeah we've been like, to his house a few times we, 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 like, we got a good relationship with him, yeah yeah and marcus marcus is great as well yeah. because he's like a, he's like he can write about music like a, Oh yeah, he's, he's just like he's yeah. so intense, he's so a, he's, a, he's a poet. Yeah, so poetic about it. He's, he's I'll tell you what, we we're bringing him over in early June for a little launch party. If you're mm -hmm. around, 
I'm definitely there for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, really and in Brick Lane, this this oh, place fantastic. called 91 in Brick Lane, we've got a Great. launch party. Oh, fantastic! I'm mean, just I'm just doing yeah, doing the final you. arrangements for it now. Hmm. I, I, I and June the eighth, Saturday, June the eighth. Okay. I'll send you the details. Cool. We've got Marcus coming over for that. So, Mikael, what what would you say is your probably your favourite ever memory of a System Seven gig? One of the most beautiful, beautiful one was in the little island of Hiroshima, and it was like a, the, sta the, the, the stage was in the temple. The people were dancing on a raft that was on a big kind of a, a, a dance floor that was on the water, and it was 150 musicians come out from everywhere. And uh, it was like bowls of Bengal. It was yeah, there was lots of different so world music. So many different groups. world music. It was for the Dalai Lama, and we were the only, one of the only we were the electronic only group. electronic groups. And there were a lot of um, there were like uh, what's his name the the. the the keyboard player, Bernie Warrell. Bernie Warrell. You know, people like that, Funkadelic, you know. And uh, and that is this. And we, they were a little, little bit kind of looking at us because we were playing kind of like techno music. They're like, it's not proper music. And uh, at the end, the the guy who was representing the Dalai Lama and the big abbot, the, the very dark man, long, the abbot of the temple, they, they came and they, and he say, he say um, we want to thank you everybody that came to do that big event it was fantastic and mm -hmm. and, and we we were on the dance floor with the abbot and we we want to particularly dance uh, say thank you to this uh, band System Seven because we realized when the people were dancing they were. They were doing the. They were they were living our mantra, and dancing like if they were on mantra. Oh, money had me hard. And that we, was the most yeah. fucking. We I had tears like, in my eyes when he said my that. My God! Yeah. And the next day, everybody was saying hello to us. The biggest, <laughs> biggest compliment I ever had <laughs> in my so life. So beautiful. Right? Like. <laughs> We didn't and expect that at all, and, it was and we knew we we got good reaction from the crowd. Yeah, but we didn't yeah. expect that. Yeah, it was such a beautiful event. The whole thing, you know. Yeah, it was in there two thousand and one. Like huge, big, big lotus flower floating on the water. The 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 the, the Japanese uh, tem temple, you know, with a red door like that. It was yeah. just bambies everywhere, in a kind of like eating piece of eating roaches and papers. <laughs> Wow. Well, that's the thing. When for, for me, um, and it's the same with youth as well. Yeah, um, and I've got so much respect for you guys because you've had such amazing achievements. You've done. You've worked with so many legendary musicians, but you, you're not as well known as like Tiesto or Paul Oakenfold or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, yeah, and and you know, youth and and yourselves. Um, for me, you encapsulate the spirit of what this is all about, you know, and and that's why you're not so well known because you haven't got this big ego like s screaming, oh yeah, you know, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. You know, you're you're just behind the scenes doing your thing, playing guitar, producing amazing, amazing music. And for, for, for you, do you see this like spiritual connection with regards to what you do, the way that you change the lives of people around the world? Uh, I know it's a big, it's, it's a big statement, isn't it? But it's true. It's true. It, it, it's um, you obviously saw well, I mean, it then. What, what, you saw, the, you the obviously way, experienced the way it when the Dalai Lama's representative came yeah. up to you, and you know you yeah, had tears yeah, in your eyes. Yeah. yeah? The, way, the way people perceive what when you're an artist, the way people perceive what you do, you can't really know how people because everyone perceives it in their own way. But we've obviously, you know, this is goes right back to the time of Gong and, and the influence of David Allen. That we've obviously worked a bit at the techniques of channeling spiritual energy through music. We are yeah. a little bit good at that. Yeah. And so <laughs> when so. nice things happen at gigs, maybe maybe that's connected with what of we do. Of course, it's connected. You know? 
but we don't know. We can't tell. In the end, we just have to do what we because do. Because you, yeah. you, 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 do, do well, yeah. you do things, you know, you don't... If you start thinking what you're doing at the moment you're doing, it's it fucked up too much, you know? Yeah. But is it's that... No, that's what David used to say. So it's, it's, it's became, when you're thinking about what you're doing, particularly in the spiritual level... You sort of lose lose, lose the lose focus, the, and he yeah. said he called it being kidnapped, design, yeah. but kidnapped by the daughters of Mara. <laughs> it's like you're surfing on this big wave, and rather than being totally absorbed with what you're doing and being in the moment and here and now, you go, "Oh wow, I'm surfing on this great wave! How fantastic!" You fall off. Yeah. Okay. And so you try not to get kidnapped by the daughters of Mara. Okay. And as well, you know you. You think you have made a, a fantastic gig at the end, and then uh, the, you the, you have uh, some fan coming and say, "Yeah, it was nice, but it, it wasn't was as good not, as seventy six. <laughs> wasn't as good as ninety two. <laughs> and you you think you have done a fantastic. You think yeah. you have done crap. Yeah, you think and it's you all think gone you wrong, and you feel like you're going to kill yourself. To catch these yeah. and, do that, and they go, oh, that was so fantastic. You know, yeah, you, well, some of your you Glade performances best. were incredible. Your, the final ever Glade, that was pretty amazing with Antonio Pagano's uh, visuals behind you. Um, also, some of the. Uh, well, you, you were there last. Uh, yeah, you, well, you, you, were there you also there. did some of the earlier Glades as well, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and you were yeah. doing some of the late night sort of uh, soirees. There. I mean, do you have a favourite memory of it as well? Well, sorry, of course you have a favourite memory, but can, 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 could I ask you? I think actually Glade, Glade 2000 was a yeah. very good one. Okay. That was really good. That was the one with um, the first Glade one. It was after we played after Simon Posford. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and remember we had an equipment problem. We all, we all thought it was going to... It was all thought... Right up until we first started playing... We thought, oh my God, I don't know if it's going to work. You know, we, it's going to go. What we're we going to do? You know, we were like really um, trepidatious. And then all of it, you just did a couple of things. Suddenly, a sound came back on, and it just all went ping, and it just went. Whoosh. And you were riding on the. And it was just away. like it was amazing. I remember. I really remember that gig, and there was like another massive crowd uh, right banked up right onto the railway track, and because when the, that was when the glade stage was the other side. It's where where it's it now. Glade Glastonbury or Glade at... Uh, no, Glade, Glade Glastonbury. Glastonbury. Glade Glastonbury, yes. Right, OK, I, I was there as well, actually. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the Glade at right. Glastonbury. I mean, yeah. the Glade at Glastonbury in 2000. The Glade Festival was Oh, we had some favorite. good times at the Glade Festival. That was well. my favourite festival. Yeah. Cause it's such a family gathering of like... Yeah. Well, that grew out of the Glade really stage yeah. at Glastonbury. Yeah. 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 OK, well, Steve McKett, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Uh, uh, it's been amazing talking to you and finding out a little bit more. Um, as I say, I wasn't sure whether to go back as far as the as the Gong days, but I think it's important because that's when you came together. And hopefully, for a, a younger audience, now they have some idea of exactly where the current music has come from, because obviously there is a, a thread which goes through all of these different scenes, and you are a living thread or a living. Living tapestry, I should say. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much. Living tapestry. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Tapestry. Tapestry. Yeah.